Tony had a big revenue beat, but shares are still down at the open. What do you think is driving that? Hey, Emily, it's good to be with you. Well, it was a great quarter, like you said. I mean, uh, record top line as well as record bottom line for the company, three consecutive quarters of straight positive EBITDA and positive cash flow for the year. Um, you know, I, I can't really make any comments about, I think, what the investment community uh, is saying. I think you're going to have to ask them about that. But, you know, for us, it's always been about mastering the fundamentals of offering the best selection, the best quality of delivery, and the best affordability in the platform. Now, you reported a 227% increase in gross order value, but you're guiding to 28% growth. I guess the big question is, you know, it seems like we're in a perfect environment for food delivery right now. But what happens after this, after vaccines, when we can go back to restaurants and the grocery store more easily? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I wish that we could be doing this in person right now and that the vaccines were already here where all of us would be fully vaccinated. And, um, you know, I, I think part of what you see in the guidance or reflected in the guidance is um, it, um, a, a perspective of what might happen, you know, post pandemic. And, and for us, really, no one has a crystal ball. Um, you know, our business uh, had been growing, certainly was growing, even as some of the markets inside the U.S. had been reopening states like Texas, Georgia, Florida reopened fairly aggressively in the May, June time period of 2020. And our business continued to grow then. But we really don't have any more data than that. And so, you know, for us, it's being prepared for all of the scenarios. But, you know, over the long term, I tend to believe that these habits from consumers are very, very sticky once they become habituated towards convenience. Now, you do own now the majority of the U.S. market, but you've got competitors like Uber Eats, like Grubhub. They are doubling down. What is your path to profitability as you also fend off the competition? Yeah, well... You know, the, for DoorDash, it's always been a focus on building the best customer across all of our audiences. And if you look at, you know, the performance of the company, I think you saw a lot of, um, you know, the growth certainly on the top line as we've extended our market leadership. But you also saw a lot of improvements uh, towards the cost structure as really, you know, we've grown our scale. Um, you know, all of our um, fixed and variable costs as a percentage of our top line have come down. And I think what you're really seeing is the growing capital efficiency in the business as we continue to further invest. So on that note, you know, Alex mentioned she she's ordering a lot. I'm ordering a lot. I'm full disclosure, a big DoorDash customer. Um, <laughs> Great customer service. If there's something not right, a missing item, um, something incorrect, you can get a refund or a credit right away. It keeps me coming back. But I wonder, how much is that costing you in terms of leakage? Is that like a big line item? Well, uh, you know, this is, you know, perfecting the service of making sure that we have zero defects is really, you know, what DoorDash is all about. Operating at the lowest level of detail to make sure that every item is accurate, that every delivery is on time, um, that every item that might be out of stock is actually, you know, given to you with a substitute that is adequate. I mean, those are all the things that we have to get right. And so for us, that is always going to be the perennial challenge. And it's what we focus the company on. And I think it's that maniacal drive of driving down, um, you know, our defect rates that you're starting to see some of these improvements in our cost structure. And these are all the costs that we bear, you know, on behalf of all of the merchants on the platform, as well as the dashers. Now, more and more jurisdictions are putting price commissions, price controls on the commissions that you can charge restaurants. How concerned are you that these are going to last and really cut into your margins? Yeah, look, we, we believe um, that, uh, you know, the price controls that you've seen are temporary. Um, and I mean, I mean, candidly, we believe they're bad policy as they usually um, achieve the opposite of their intended desire. Um, and in fact, they'll decrease revenues and actually create less earnings opportunities for dashers. I mean, if you think about the purpose of DoorDash, it is to grow and to transform these brick and mortar businesses so that they can compete. So measuring the profitability that we deliver for the merchants, I mean, that is really our North Star. That's why I'm super proud of the fact that all of the efforts that we took during the pandemic and even currently and beyond have made merchants on DoorDash eight times more likely to have survived this pandemic than otherwise. And so, you know, we have a set of products, you know, one half of which are our marketplace in which we're investing billions of dollars for the delivery, billions of dollars towards marketing to bring incremental demand to merchants. And, and then on the other side, we're giving 
merchants the tools to build their own digital channels commission-free through DoorDash Drive as well as, well as DoorDash Storefront. Right. Um, Uber is now your biggest competitor by market share. I, I talked to Dara uh, after their earnings report. Uh, they just did that, that Drizzly acquisition, but he said, we're done with acquisitions. We're doubling down on our organic growth. We're doubling down on grocery. grocery. What are going to be your biggest growth drivers of the future? You've got the convenience store vertical, um, you know, which is sort of a nod to the future. But, but what's the next chapter? Yeah, if you look at what DoorDash is working on, I mean, we're really working on four things. You know, first is really extending our market leadership in our core category of restaurants, which um, we believe has massive runway ahead of it. Uh, extending that leadership position in the U.S. as well as doubling down on some of our strong international performance where we're gaining share and improving profitability is certainly one big pillar. The second, you m mentioned it in the question, is we're extending this platform to other categories. In fact, in less than a year, according to third-party estimates, DoorDash is now also the largest delivery platform in the U.S. for convenience items. And so I think you're starting to see some of the extensibility of our platform into some of these other categories. Third, we're continuing to invest in products like DoorDash Drive, Storefront, and inventing new products and services so that merchants can have the same digital products to create their digital businesses as we do for our marketplace. And fourth, we're growing our international presence. Any plans to invest in Bitcoin, Tony? Every executive seems to be having to make a decision about that or, or take Bitcoin as a form of payment. Uh, we're certainly more operators than we are investors at DoorDash, although obviously we are also investors of capital as we allocate capital towards projects. Um, no intentions at this point to invest in Bitcoin, but we are following closely what's happening. What about as a form of payment? Would you accept it? That's something that we're considering, but, uh, you know, no news to be made on that point today. <laughs> All right. So last question. Look, Prop 22 has passed. You spent a lot uh, to pass that in California to make sure that your dashers could still be treated as contractors. It does mean you're going to have to pay them a little bit more in benefits. But I know this was really important to you. Um, is it going to be complicated to roll this out? How does this affect the company's future? Yeah, we're very excited about Prop 22. I mean, in fact, it's already been rolled out. It was rolled out late Q4 um, around December, uh, and it, it's had um, astounding impact. Um, and it's one of the few policies I've seen where the outcomes actually achieve the intended objectives, which really were to give the dashers, the workers, the flexibility that they've told us over and again that they prefer and pair it with protections that we believe they deserve. I mean, we're super thrilled that the voters in California on both sides of the aisle overwhelmingly supported the dashers in this regard. And so when you look at some of the results, dasher earnings are up, like you said. Um, dashers in California, um, in the Bay Area, they're earning $35 an hour, including tips in San Diego, $32 an hour, including tips when they're on the app. Um, and Dasher net promoter scores have risen 50% after passing Prop 22. So it's been a huge win all around in which we're giving Dashers the flexibility that they prefer, and we're pairing it with portable and proportionate benefits.